Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Hey, uh, I got something during worship I want to share with you. And I'm always humbled and amazed when I feel God kind of shows me something. And uh, how many of you got kids? A few of you. All right. You ever notice, like, when your kid comes in the room and does something silly, if you as the parent start laughing at them, it, like, energizes them to keep going? As if, like, you approve of this foolish dance that they're doing, and because you started laughing, they just... Start doing it more. Yes? yes. Is that accurate? Yes. And during worship, I felt like there was a lot of people, not a lot, a few people in the room who couldn't worship today because maybe you don't feel qualified to worship. You don't feel good enough to worship. You don't see God as loving you. And I want to tell you today, I felt so overwhelmed by this to just tell you today that God is so stinking proud of you. If, if, if I be so bold to speak on behalf of God as a, as a prophetic word, God is so stinking proud of you. God, maybe you haven't heard your dad, your biological father, tell you that. And because your biological father hasn't told you that you have a hard time believing that God is proud of you. And maybe today you're saying, well, how could God be proud of me? I haven't done anything to be worthy for him to be proud of, you've missed the whole point as to who God is. God is proud of you because you're his child, because you're alive today, because you have a breath. There's nothing you have to do to impress him to tell you that he's proud of you. And if you don't ever feel that God is proud of you, that he delights in you, that he's just overwhelmingly in love with you, you'll never step into true worship with him. Amen. You'll never experience father-son worship, daddy-daughter worship. Like, you'll never experience that until you break through that and understand that it's not based upon your ability to behave his laws and his rules. It's his ability to show his unwavering love toward you. Amen. Today we're in a series called Amazing Grace. Amazing grace. And here's the question. Here's the thesis of my entire message. And you're going to hear it over and over and over again. It's this question. Ready? Who can God use? Who can God use? And in order to answer that question, we must go back into the Bible and discover who God did use. Is that fair? So I am a, a Bible student. I, I am a theologian. I study scripture through and through. If you've ever read your Bible, you too are a theologian. All right? I know you don't see yourself that way, but any, any discerning of scripture makes you a theologian. And so we've got to go into scripture. This is a Bible-based church. We've got to go into scripture and see what scripture says. I will tell you this. Do not believe anything I say today. Don't believe anything I say. Go home, look it up for yourself, and prove me right or wrong, whichever one you feel, right? Go back into the word for yourself and look these things up, okay? I ask you today, do not compare my sermon that I'm about to share with you to another man's sermon, Amen. to something you heard someone else say. Amen. Take my sermon today, judge it by the word of God, and by what the Holy Spirit says to you while you're studying. Is that fair enough? Yeah. Okay. Who can God use? I love looking at Bible stories. I love studying characters of the Bible. And, and we, we, we read a bunch of stories of guys who did great things. Someone like David. Dave, I love the fact that we know that David was a giant slayer. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Because any time in my life... I'm coming up against a, a doubt 
or a limiting belief, something that I don't think that I can conquer or break through in my life. I replay a, the, the story of David in my head, and I'm that little kid running with a slingshot, and I'm going to attack this giant that's trying to stop me from moving ahead in my life. I love knowing that David led an army of men called the mighty men of valor. I love knowing that. But David had a dark side. David had a fault in his armor. David was attracted to a woman that didn't belong to him. In fact, David was attracted to a woman that belonged to another man. He took her for his own, and he had him killed. So, in spite of David being an adulterer and a murderer, God used him. In fact, he's the only man in Scripture that said was a man after God's own heart. The prophet Elijah was overcome with fear and he ran from his calling. Moses had severe anger issues to the point that he murdered someone. Peter too was angry and Peter was a coward. He denied Christ three times. The apostle Paul approved of Stephen's stoning. Noah was a drunk. Jacob raised the most dysfunctional family that we have ever known. Judah slept with his daughter-in-law. But... It's only because he mistaken her for a prostitute. (laughs) Rahab was a prostitute. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived, but he was a sex addict, and he died of syphilis. Jonah ran from God multiple times and got swallowed by a fish just to be spit out to become a preacher. Thomas doubted. Doubting Thomas, yet led one of the largest churches in the entire Bible. Who can God use? And through my intellect and study, it appears that God uses perfect people. Huh? God uses perfect people. Huh? He spoke to Moses through a burning bush. He correct Balaam's course by speaking through a donkey. Who can God use? The Bible says in Luke 19 that if my people will not praise me, even the rocks and the trees will cry out. Who can God use? (laughs) I'm setting you up. You get that, right? Yeah, that's why you're quiet, right? Because you know it's a setup. (laughs) Hear me very carefully. God does not disqualify people from being used by him. Humanity disqualifies each other from being used by God. Man says that person needs to get better first, and then God can. Man does that. Man, man diminishes the power of God by saying who can and cannot be used by God. Ooh. First Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. All right, so to the world, to those who actually think they're better than the cross, that they don't really need salvation because they do good, the idea is foolishness. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Let's skip all the way to the end. But God, say but God. Okay. Okay. Anytime that is in passage, but God, we call it God's big butt. All right? And it's meaning that there's a big statement that he's about to say, but God. All this stuff was true. All this stuff happens. All this stuff is how man sees, but God. But God's about to blow your mind. God's about to change some things. He's about to turn it on its paradigm shift. Are you ready? But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world 
to shame the strong. Who can God use? Well, according to this passage, he can use your dumb self. Right? He can use yourself who keeps doing the same mistake over and over and over again. And I, I came to that passage, and seriously, I had to study this out. Because I really couldn't find the answer. I'm like, God, I'm not understanding this. I need, I need to figure this out. Why does it seem, God, that you only use broken people? And really, like a whole day, I'm studying this. Why does God, why does it seem, seem as if God is only using broken people? And I finally came to the conclusion. Because that's all he's got to work with. We all have broken pieces in our story. Maybe you've arrived to some layer of success, but in the story of your past, there's broken pieces. God uses the broken things to confound the wise or to confuse those who believe they are perfect people. Romans 3.21 says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God have been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. Ready? This righteousness is given through faith and, and in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So how do you get right standing with God? Faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. The only way you get right standing with God is through faith in Jesus Christ, not by any other human effort. Faith in Jesus Christ makes you right with God. Therefore, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For who have sinned? All have sinned. All. All. Everybody, even the people judging other people. Yeah, there's a verse in the Bible. It says that, that foolishness is looking yourself in the mirror and then immediately forgetting the way you look. Okay? So can I tell you what that means to me, that verse? It's, it's about judgment, right? I want to go judge you, but I forgot what I look like. It's like looking in the mirror... And you have a big booger in your nose. But then you walk away without dealing with the situation. And all day long, you got this thing in your face that everybody can see. And you haven't dealt with it. You could have dealt with it when you were looking in the mirror. But you're walking around pointing out, that person's got a receding hairline. That person's overweight. This, and you got a booger in your nose. Yes. Amen. Come on, somebody. Yes. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Who can God use? This passage is clear that God has to use people who have sinned. Am I wrong? But, listen, this is your truth. Based upon scripture, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, then God has to use people who have sinned. Is that logical? Okay, we're building a belief system here. I can hear people online, this is blasphemy. Yep, that's what they said about Jesus too. And that's what they said about Paul. And that's what they said about Peter. That's exact, that, it, you're exactly right. Because people want to be blessed based upon their ability to be good. And you can't. Your personal self-righteousness is as of filthy rags. We have been justified freely through the redeeming grace of Christ. Well, Pastor Mike... Does this just mean that we should just go on and just live sinful lives, live lascivious lives? Is that the conclusion that you're drawing? No! Paul said, God forbid, if that's what you got out of what I'm saying, you need remedial classes on scripture. 
Like you need help because that, that's not at all what anybody's saying. What we're saying is living your guilty life that God doesn't love you isn't helping any. When my mama would say to me, wait for your father to get home, that did not want my dad to come home. I didn't want my dad to come home. And I wasn't like, yeah, dad's home. I'm gonna get my butt whipped. Yeah, I can't wait. Can't wait to hug him and hang out and play ball. No, I was afraid of him. The Bible says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And when we believe that there's further punishment, we can't love that way. It's not actual love, it's fear. And it's not the fear of the Lord, it's fear of the Lord. It's being afraid of God. It's being terrified of his presence. Galatians 5.13 says, my brothers and sisters, you were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping one command, not 10, not 613, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the problem. You don't love yourself. You know what you've done. You know what your past is. You carry that around. You carry a deficiency around that doesn't love self. And then you've been told, oh my God, if I could just smack every preacher that did this to you, I'm sorry. You've been told that that guilt and that shame that you carry around is the condemn, is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is against the sin of the world, which is the rejection of Jesus Christ. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If you'd let me in, we'd sup together, I'd be with you. There's only one sin that the Holy Spirit convicts of, and it's the need of a savior. There's a difference between conviction and correction. He will correct the believer. He will adjust and, and, and lead the believer. The conviction is to the world. <sighs> study it out. Don't believe me. Don't believe me. Go study this out. He will convict the world of sin, the believer of their righteousness. There will be this inward, I am a child of God. I am seated in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. Therefore, I don't have to bow my knee to what my flesh wants to do. I'm going to set somebody free today. 1 Peter 2, 16, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's servants. I've had people say to me, Pastor Mike, if you keep preaching like this, people are just going to go out and do whatever they want. There's the problem. Not what you're doing. Why do you want to do it? Can I go somewhere real far today that no one else is going to say from their stage today? Huh? I have permission? Don't, 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 don't say anything out loud. Just ponder on this. The person who has an addiction to pornography... Why do you want to do that? I know, that's a heavy one. That's a heavy one. The tool isn't the problem. It is, it's wrong, but it's a tool, like any other tool. The question is, what has happened in your life that makes you feel like you need to do that? or you want to do that, what, what is it, what has happened in your life that your flesh desires to use that tool as a coping mechanism? That's what we have to deal with. This is what Christ came and is talking about. This is what Paul is talking about. We wanna stand up here and talk about, well, you, are, you have the ability to control your behavior, but you're thinking about it. 
What's the root cause? What's the root cause of someone drinking too much alcohol? Alcohol is just a tool. Alcohol is not the problem. What is causing you to want to drink alcohol excessively? What's the, what happened to you? What did you experience? What have you been through? What were you told? Come on, somebody, hear me, hear me, hear me. But we want to judge the expression instead of deal with the root. And a lot of the root is, are you ready? You don't love you. You don't respect you. You don't honor you because of some sort of limiting belief that you've told yourself and you probably told it to yourself as a child. And when you told yourself that limiting belief as a child, you accepted it as your reality. And you say it to yourself over and over and over again. I'm not gonna go any deeper on that. You'll have to sign up for my coaching program for that. But we're talking about a limiting belief in your life, a limiting belief in your life. And then, so, so, so this is what the church will say, so that the church can control your behavior, that, that limiting belief, that bad feeling that you have, that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That will never lead you to freedom because you think you're supposed to live that way. I'm supposed to live feeling bad because this is God. No, God sees you as that free little kid dancing foolishly, and he's like, yeah, that's my boy, that's my girl. And you're out there dancing all foolishly, yeah, because he wants us free. He doesn't want us in bondage to our emotions. He doesn't want us in anger. He doesn't want us in resentment. I mean, can I just ask you a question? When you got married, did you think that you were going to be angry at your spouse for 23 years? Did you sign up for, is like that what you signed up for? No, like you signed up to like have the, I saw your honeymoon pictures to be chilling on the beach in Jamaica and running around and having fun, like that's what you signed up for. But yet we're settling for angry lives, coming home from work and being angry at each other. And we're accepting that as the norm and what reality is. In this. We need the freedom in Jesus. Who can God use? It's clear from Scripture, God can use you, and God can use me. But just in case we don't actually believe that, let's shout some answers out out loud, okay? And don't wait for someone else to answer. You shout your truth out. Is that okay? Okay. Can God use someone who's divorced? Can God use someone who struggles with addiction? Drug addiction, yes. alcohol addiction, yes. sex addiction. Yes. That was less loud. <laughs> Can God use someone who's had an abortion? Yes. Can God use someone who's committed murder? Yes. Can God use someone who struggles with their sexual identity? I'm just asking questions. I'm just asking questions in light of scripture. I'm in my, I'm in a master, my master's program to get my, my MDiv, Masters of Divinity, and we ha I'm in a class called Spiritual Hermeneutics. Basically, it's uh, translating or, or, or analyzing scripture in light of the Pentecostal experience, in light of the Holy Spirit. And we have to keep drawing our own conclusions based upon scripture that we read. And this is all I'm trying to bring to you today, okay? Who can God use? And based upon our study of scripture, you have said, a lot of you, majority, some of you just refuse to say anything, God can use everybody that I just said. Who can God use? Use. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if we declare with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that one believes and is justified, just as if you'd never sinned, 
And with your mouth, confession of faith is made unto salvation. Who can God use? All who call upon the name of the Lord. And then even then, a bush that was on fire didn't call upon the name of the Lord, but God used it. And a donkey was used to speak to Balaam. And I'm pretty sure he wasn't a Christian. (laughs) Who can God use? And before anyone online or anyone in the room judges someone else who God is using, I just wonder if maybe he asked to use you first and you said no. I know, I know that's got to be the case with me. I know. I know someone else was asked to do this job first. And they said no. So he was like, all right, Mike, go ahead. Go ahead. God can use anyone and anything he wants to. He's God. He's God. We are the ones who have the problem seeing God use someone we don't think is worthy. Yeah, but do you know about their, are you about to step into sin like their sin? Are you about to stand in a place of judgment and tell me somebody's past? You better shut your hell trap of a mouth. Because you're speaking the voice of Satan, the accuser of the brethren. That's why he said his mercies are new every morning. Yesterday's your past. I don't care what you did yesterday. I can still smell it on your breath, but I don't care. What are you choosing to do in this moment? How are you choosing to worship God today? How are you choosing to honor God today? I don't care what yesterday held. God's not keeping record of your wrongs. He's keeping record of your righteousness. He's keeping record of your righteousness. So who's left? Who's left for God to use? The broken, the wounded, the busted, the disgusted. Anyone who will say to him yes with an open heart of thankfulness and a true understanding that none of us deserve his grace that he's extended to us. But because he's chosen to give me his grace, I will then walk and operate in it. Who can God use? Let me turn the page for a second and speak to your spirit. Speak to you, not your intellect, not your reason, but to you. Are you ready? You are stronger than your most powerful weakness. You are stronger than your most powerful weakness. Is that an oxymoron? Absolutely. You. And again, I'm not talking to your intellect. I'm not talking to your flesh. I'm not talking to your willpower. I'm talking to your spirit. You, the real you, that abides inside of your temple is more powerful than your strongest weakness. Your strongest weakness cannot overpower who you are. You choose every day the actions that you're going to do. You choose them. You have the power over that. No one, listen to me, listen to me. I had to get this revelation. No one can make you angry. No one. No one can can, can trigger you. No one. No one can make you depressed. No one can hurt your feelings. No one can give you a bad day. You are choosing to respond to stimulus the way you respond. I'm empowering you today. 
I'm empowering you today. Don't you dare let someone ruin your day. You know why you, know you have a bad day? You know why you get in a bad mood? Because you can't control someone else's behavior. And because that person didn't do for you what you wanted them to do, now you're triggered. No, you're undisciplined. You're a baby. Babies cry when they don't get what they want. Babies cry when they're hungry. Adults get up and make a sandwich. I'm trying to help somebody today. I'm trying to help somebody today. You're looking, at, you're looking at the biggest victim in the entire world. You're looking at a person who blamed every situation and everybody around them for their bad behavior. No, no, but you don't know what happened to me. And because of that, I'm doing this. Yeah, 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 yeah. But guess who's a grown up now? Guess who's in charge of this temple now? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Well, I was, a, I was a wrestler in high school, and, and if I got put in like a really painful position, my response to pain was laughing. And the more it hurt, the more I laughed. Same stimulus, where someone else was putting the same thing, they started crying, I laughed. It's just stimulus. You choose. You choose how you respond to life. You were in control of that. You're in control of the tone of your voice. You're in, you're in control of how you respond to somebody. Yeah, but the way they said, ugh. The way they said nothing has nothing to do with how you respond. You are in control of you. Check this out, closing it up real quick here in 1 Corinthians 10, 23. It says, I have the right to do anything, you say. You do, true, fact. You have the right to do anything, but not everything's beneficial. You have the right to eat an entire box of Twinkies. Yes, you do, but that's not beneficial. You're going to spike your blood sugar. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Can we talk one more time? Yes. It hurts my heart that in a, in a job that we have as, as a community of believers, that we would make it so hard for people to find Jesus. And if, and, and, and then there's a question, right? So in one of my classes, we have to have this discussion. How come the church in America is shrinking today? And, and people want to say, it's because of Christian consumerism. People are just coming and attending church and they're not doing anything, they're not sharing their faith, blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, no, that's not the problem. The problem is, is that the church has disqualified everybody. People are good enough to come and get saved and give their tithe, but if they don't behave, they can't be used. Why would I sign up and keep coming to something that God can't use me? They didn't like it. They didn't like that. So then I had to get, I had to get petty. Anybody ever get petty? You put a little petty LaBelle up in here. I had to put a little petty LaBelle. <laughs> I had to go look at their profile pictures on Facebook. I'm just saying. I had to go look at your life. And I'm going to tell you something. These people who want to be judging, judging people's behavior, Judging people's gender. Come on. Come, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Judging people's sexuality. Every single one of them had me by like 100 pounds. <laughs> Fat. Had me by at least 10 Twinkies. Had me by at least one clogged artery. Now, I read my Bible, and it says that gluttony is a sin. Oh, wait a second, but because you don't want that to be a sin, it's okay. 
Did I get petty? Yeah, I got petty. I'm going to tell you why I got petty. Because I went and I got, <laughs> I went and I got a physical, and they got this thing from the pit of hell called the BMI. The ba- body mass index was created by an anorexic. That nurse said to me, Mr. McKelvey, you are obese. I can't tell you what I said back to her because it was ungodly and unscriptural and profane. I had to repent. Obese? I'm 42 years old. I heard that dad bonds are sexy. So I got a little petty and I had to go, I had to go tell people about themselves that you want to judge somebody. Yeah, but, 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 but they're living in sin. So are you. You're overweight. You wake up and sin every day. You defile the temple of the Holy Ghost. You stretch it in ways it wasn't supposed to be. <laughs> Pastor Mike, are you making the word of God of none effect? No, no, they are. They are. If we can call sin, sin, then we can work on it. If we can call sin, sin, we can work on it. We can say, hey, this doesn't align with God's best. So let's work on this. Let's coach through this. Let's mentor through this. But that's not what the church wanted. The church wants to say, you're wrong, you're in sin, you're on discipline. Instead of saying, hey, why don't we talk about this? What is bringing you to a place that you want to dishonor God with your life? What's the root of saying, I want to do something that God is saying I should not do. (laughs) If a boyfriend and girlfriend come and they say to me, Pastor Mike, we want to be used by God, we live together, we're living in sin. So okay, what is it about knowing that you know this is wrong, that this is not God's best, according to scripture, why do you feel this is okay, and what's the struggle? Come on, we're gonna have these conversations. This is, what, this is what Paul is telling Timothy and, and the church that, that needs to happen. We need to have these conversations. What's the root of living and doing things? What, what's the root of you being angry? It's not that everybody has to stop pulling your triggers. What's the, why are you angry? What happened to you? Who hurt you? Who disappointed you? Who let you down? See, if we can deal with me and you can deal with you, And we can say, Lord, use me. You see me as pure and holy. You see me as right and true. You see me as a vessel unto honor, not to dishonor. God, if you could use a burning bush, if you could use a donkey, if you could use trees and rocks, you could use these people who have major, major character flaws in the Bible, God, you can use me. How would you like that to be? And then we need to be transparent to ask the next question. Are you ready? Lord, what needs to be removed of my life that you could, that I could give you the best option to work with? The Bible tells us, let me rephrase this. I have people tell me that this message that I preach, this this topic goes too far. You're going to the right. You're going all the way to the right wing. You're going too far. And my response to that is, I'm not going too far. God went too far. Like, dear God, I can't believe you just said that about God Almighty. (laughs) Hear me out. Hear, Hear me why. Hear me why. Hear me why. Hear me why. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, which means there are going to be people who don't believe in him. He gave his son to die with no promise that anybody would love him. That's too far. I got three kids. 
My youngest is my son, LJ, Liam Joseph. And I promise you this, there is no one in all creation that I would ever allow my son to die for. I wouldn't do it. I promise you, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. I would not sacrifice my son for any, uh, anybody. I don't care. Any, no, never. I, I give Abraham all the credit in the world that he was willing to offer Isaac. I couldn't do it. That's too far. That's the God I serve. That before I could ever take a step toward him, he went too far to reach me. That's grace. And that doesn't give me a freedom to go do bad things. That brings me to a place that says, Lord, I want to be my best, true self for you. I want to show up for you in life every day. I want to stop using my past as an excuse to hurt myself and hurt other people. I want to show up for you and live right for you. That's what that does. That's what that real, true yearning does when we understand God's love towards us. Father, we come to you today. And Lord, I pray that we would get this revelation of your grace. That while we were far from you, you came running to us. You call us your very own. Help us to understand your grace, your undeserved favor. I pray that we would operate and walk in your favor. That things would just begin to go our way. That we would stop confessing with our mouths a negative reality and we would begin to live in the reality of your glory and your grace. I pray God today that if there's anybody who's far from you, that you tug at their heart today and call them towards you. If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we're going to practice what Acts, I mean Romans 10, 9, and 10 says. We are going to believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. And if you're here today and you need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, would you pray this with me? Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you just type amen in one of our chat rooms? One of our online hosts would love to send you our devotional called Starting Point. If you're in the room today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you allow me the honor to just celebrate you for two seconds? Would you just wave at me and say, I prayed that for the first time today? Anybody at all as I look across the room real quick? Anybody? Yeah, I see you back there. Anybody else? Yeah, I see you. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I see you, man. Yeah, I see you, okay, okay, yeah. Welcome home, welcome home. That same devotional is available to you. We have care team members in the front and in the back, ushers available as well. There's a high top table in the lobby uh, that you can grab that copy. If you need prayer for any reason today, would you take a moment, come up and see one of our care team members, they'd love to pray with you. If you came looking for something specific today, don't leave until you get it. If you need a hug, you need, you need someone, listen, you know what, there's somebody here that you just need to be noticed. You just need someone to say, I saw you, I see you. I, does anybody see me? Does anybody know I'm, yeah, so, all right, so I'm gonna tell you this. I'm gonna empower you, come get what you want. Come, come get somebody to see you, all right? Come give me a hug or something, all right, if that's, if that's you today. Uh, if you need... If you need counseling, get signed up with one of our counselors. If you need to come to our Celebrate Recovery program on Thursday nights, get signed up for that. Whatever it is that you need to be your healthiest, true self going to 2022, get it today. Father, we thank you that this word will not return void. It will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. I thank you that everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. 
First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at familychurchny.com to get started today.